The law protects the inviolability of humans. Interference from others, whether or not they result in actual harm to the victim, are actionable. Today we discuss assault and battery. He came out of the car, dragged me out of the car, started beating me, slapping me, punching me, asking me whether the road is for my dad or is for me. He did unnecessary things to me, sat in their car and then sped off. My name is Noella Seydoux. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Stay tuned. Joining me on the show today, as usual, are two private legal practitioners, Mr. Bright Ochri Ejekum and Mr. Eddie Makati. Gentlemen, you're welcome. Well, thank, thank you very much. much. Interference to a person resulting in physical harm, psychological harm, curtailment of freedom, and harassment are all actionable per se, meaning the victim does not need to prove actual injury in order to hold an action against the offender. What really is, you know, assault and battery? Well, the whole concept of assault and battery, as you indicated, interference with the body of a person, falls under the area of law we call tort. And that interference can be one of other three uh, areas, either assault, battery, or false imprisonment. Of course, false imprisonment is not our interest for today. Yes. So I look at assault. Assault is a situation whereby Mr. A causes Mr. B to have a reasonable apprehension of interference or force to him. So basically, um, I operate in a way that makes you feel like in the immediacy I could attack you and I have the capacity to attack you. Yes. That is assault. That is assault. Well, to move the discussion a bit further, um, my learned colleague here talked about the, the civil aspect of it. Yes. I want to discuss the criminal aspect of it. And in our Act 29, which regulates behavior and all the crimes in Ghana, yeah. uh, Section 85 talks about different kinds of assaults which are covered under our criminal jurisprudence. So in <clears throat> the third section, sorry, yeah. you realize that there's assault and battery. Mm -hmm. There's assault without actual battery. Yes. And then yes. there's false imprisonment, which uh, my learned colleague was earlier on alluding to. But that is another discussion for another day. Yes. So for the criminal aspect where you can be prosecuted and then there could be a jail time. But uh, in this instance, I believe... Uh, in our criminal jurisprudence, it is a misdemeanor. So there's a, a little distinction. You can either get a fine or go to jail. It yeah. is not that serious. That is, yeah. uh, it is not a felonious crime. Yes. So there's either a fine or a jail term when you are not able to pay your fine. So just to move the discussion a bit further, there's a criminal aspect of assault and battery. In proving assault and battery under mm -hmm. criminal law, we're looking at actually not just apprehension of, you know, an attack or, you know, the, the fear factor, but we're looking at actually touching the person or interfering with the person's body. Not necessarily. As you indicated, the criminal provision on assault. Yes. The word, the name assault is used generically. And then provision is made as to what will constitute it. So there can be assault when there is physical touch yes. or contact. Yes. That would be assault. So that is assault plus battery. Yes. You can have assault without battery. Yes. Where it's just a reasonable apprehension of fear. Yes. That's but that is also, under the yeah. civil... That is also no. the criminal. That's under the criminal. Yes. The criminal. That is also one scenario. And as he said, the false imprisonment. Yes. Which we are reserving for another day. Another day. Yes. So yeah. assault, as used in criminal law, looks at three scenarios, mm -hmm. not only battery, or not only assault. So assault itself without battery, and then assault plus battery. 
and then the other leak, false imprisonment. Okay, and then to look at the civil side of it, we realize that uh, assault can stand on its own, and battery can stand on its own, which means a uh, plaintiff, uh, anyone who is aggrieved, will be able to sue a defendant, someone who has caused a civil wrong to that person yeah. in court. You can either sue specifically for an, ass ass an assault, mm -hmm. and then you can also sue specifically for a battery. But then the interesting twist is that to be able to sue and su be successful at it, you must be able to prove certain elements. Absolutely. Yes, and these elements are captured. There are about six elements which constitute battery. Yes. And these must be captured in your statement of claim, as we lawyers term it. Yeah. So to be able to successfully sue for battery, you must be able to prove all these. Yes. And then to be able to successfully sue for an assault, you must be able to prove about five elements. We'll go for a quick commercial break now. And when we come back, we'll go into the elements of assault and battery. But before then, we'll listen to the public and then find out what they think about this whole topic, assault and battery. <laughs> Like, I did not know I could sue someone for touching me, just touching me, you know, I did not know. I actually know that someone touching you without your permission is, you can sue the person and all that. Oh no, I didn't know about that one. I didn't know. If my male boss touches me in a non-professional way, probably slap him. <laughs> in that, at that instance, I would slap him. I mean, what rights does a person have to just touch you just like that without your permission? It's only when I'm married that my husband has some authority over my body. But if you're not my husband, you don't have right over my body. I know that people have rights, especially uh, uh, touching people without their consent. Hello, I'm not comfortable with what you are doing. Then after that, if it is becomes consistent, I'll probably report him so that he doesn't do that to me again. If it does continue, then the law must take its course. What will I do? Some threatens me. Well, basically, I just report the person to the police. If I, if I feel my life is in danger, that's all I will do. Of course, straight on, uh, I go to the police. Once a, a threat is issued, the police must get involved, definitely. No, there are no two ways about that. But these days, uh, it, it looks as if uh, the police are a bit unconcerned about some of these things. You go and report and they don't take it serious. Just like recently, what happened to this girl at uh, IPS? I believe the boyfriend threatened her. She reported, and I doubt if the police ever took it serious. Later, what we got to hear was that she's been stabbed and killed. So if somebody threatens me, I will threaten that person back. What should I do if a mate slaps me in a church or? <laughs> That's really embarrassing. I don't know. <laughs> I think I'll be confused. I would say a knife for a knife, too sweet, too bad. I'll retaliate and hit the person back. <laughs> hit him back. Maybe we'll fight. Yeah. Or call on some people to come and just deal with him properly. I probably would uh, let my boyfriend or my, my brother beat the person in return, yes. I think I'll cry or something and I'll calm down. And then report the person to the authorities. If I cannot retaliate and um, uh, the law will be by my side, well, why not? There is no way I'll sit on consent for somebody to just hit me and I'll just gloss over it. But in most cases, I, I feel getting, fighting, beating somebody, it's, 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 I don't think there's a need to go to the police or anything though. Wow, very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, I am shocked. <laughs> you are shocked. I'm <laughs> shocked. I think this is the essence of Law Express, so that people get to know because it's a social service program and yeah. the whole idea is to educate them so you can protect yourself within the law. Yes, yeah. and we really commend Law Express for the good work being done. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that also shows the, the need for people to know what the law is because the law is not just for the grandeur stuff. Yeah. It's basic things that happen on the streets, uh, basic human associations and contacts. Yeah. Because assault and battery 
It's, it's about simple human contact. Yes. Not necessarily being tied up and being beaten. Yeah, it was, it's what happens in the community. In the community. Yeah. So and everyday life. Everyday yes. life. Yeah. Yes. So I, th I think, and it's, it's the, the voice has brought some of these things out. Yeah. Moving on to what the elements of um, assault and battery, I think we should just perhaps limit it to elements of battery. Mm. There, there should be a direct act yes. by the person, you know, who, who commits the offense. That is so. And by direct act, it should have been something you did yourself. So to say, it should have been voluntary. Yes. Uh, I would look at the definition, so to say, of battery. Mm -hmm. we've, we've tried to define assault. Yes. Well, let's try to define battery. Battery is taken as an intentional application of force mm -hmm. on another. Yes. And so, so from that definition, you can draw the various elements. Of course, you ought to have intended what you you you. you you are doing. Yes. It shouldn't have been an accident. It shouldn't have been mistake. an accident. Yeah. It should have been voluntary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The recipient of the force mm -hmm. ought to be aware of it. Okay. And there should be contact yes. for purposes of battery. Yes. There should be yeah. contact. Yes. Well, just to add to that, uh, you spoke about the direct act. Yes. There's also the element of voluntariness that mm -hmm. is. Uh, there must be controllability, not yes. necessarily willingness. Uh, yeah as in the defendant should be in control of the act. Yes. So just to give a very quick example, mm -hmm. if for instance, I am riding a horse, mm -hmm. okay, and there's a large crowd. Which is crowd. quite unlikely though. Yes, quite <laughs> unlikely, but I, I know at the beach there are lots of horses. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay, so I'm on the beach and I'm riding a horse and uh, my senior here slaps the back of the horse and this horse just veers into Oof. the crowd and actually harms another uh, yeah. beach reveler or yeah. any person who's on the beach to have fun. Mm -hmm. And this person is hurt. The person can actually sue him mm -hmm. and not me who was on the horse because his action it's sort of spared yes. or set the event into In motion. motion. Yes. Okay, so the element of voluntariness is, is, is I should how chip it in is that The person does not even have to be injured. No, not necessarily. Because yes. apart, uh, as part of the elements of um, battery, mm. you you should you should um, not you should not have consented to yes. that contact. That is true. Um, so um, people have to be wary here, where you you walk in and then you see a friend, and then you run up to the person, just hit the person or pat yes. the person, yes. even just touching the person without the person's consent yes. can open you up to an action. That is so. And battery. to add to that, it's like we said from the beginning. It's this actionable per se. Yes. So there's no need to even to prove, prove damage. That you are damage is just it just adds up to whatever you get from the court. Yes. 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 Then to move it further, there's the state of mind as well. Mm -hmm. So the plaintiff should be able to prove that the, the and state by of plaintiff, the mind does the victim. The victim yes. who the is now going to, to sue. Yes. The one first. who goes to court. Uh, who is suing the defendant. The defendant is the one who has committed the tort yes. or the particular crime. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you must be able to show that he had uh, an intention to, to do, do that. that particular act. Yes. Then uh, there's the physical contact. And this is specifically for battery. Yes. The physical contact is for battery because in assault, you don't need to prove physical contact. Then we'll move on to the fourth element, which would be lack of consent. Because you, uh, uh, prima facie or in law, no one can consent to being harmed. Yes. Yes, but there are instances where the police and special forces are given certain powers to be able to cause some amount of harm. Yes. But that is justifiable under law. So there must be lack of consent on the part of the person who is going on to On the sue. consent bit. Yes. So if somebody claims that um, I beat her up because she asked me to beat her up, yes. it's, it's not a defense. Not There's no all. way no, you can get can away with it. It still is battery. Yes. The, 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 <laughs> As you said, you cannot consent to be beaten. Of course, exceptions will be made to that rule. For, for example, sports, boxers, yes. who uh, engage in boxing, they consent to that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Manny Parkwak could not have sued Mayweather mm -hmm. for the beating he received. And <laughs> wrestling? A couple of a couple wrestling, soccer, yeah. where there's yeah. bodily contact. Yes. You cannot sue the opponent because he tackled you roughly. 
That takes my mind really, you know, I, I, I sometimes like to think that I have a fertile mind. You know, there are new or modern trends of sexual activity. I don't know how, I've forgotten what the terminology is, mm. where people allow others to be chained and tied, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know whether this could also, you know, operate or qualify as battery because, yes, you consented, but yes. then you, are, you could be injured and mostly you are whipped. You yeah. know, and, you know, all of those things. That, that's, I'm sure, should be something that perhaps with advancements in the law we should look at and maybe, you know, we, 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 we should. <laughs> litigate and as moot I, I to I see how at, it ends. <laughs> I will look at that from the domestic violence point. Uh, in a domestic setting, of course, the Domestic Violence Act makes uh, provisions for violence mm -hmm. that is exacted on people we in a domestic setting. This is not violence, counsel. This is something you derive pleasure from. But you are being beaten all right. <laughs> There's blood flowing all right. You are being injured. And it comes back to the talk about whether or not you can consent to be beaten or punished. Well, the position of the law is that you cannot consent <laughs> to be beaten. So you, the aggressor, Mm -hmm. or the other <laughs> sexual party. Yes. Uh, I, I, my position is that you should take it that you are opening yourself up for a possible action. Because in some of our traditional settings, it's said that uh, beating a wife or something is a sexual act. It's a show of love. Wow. <laughs> Certain <laughs> groupings in our societies have that view. That's just outrageous. But that, uh, that itself uh, can amount to domestic violence. <laughs> totally. As a matter of statutory law. Totally. You know, so you cannot consent to be beaten. Yeah. And the point he made about the intention is particularly important in the criminal setting. Because for the criminal setting, you must prove what the law is called mens rea. Yeah. That's the evil mind or the evil intent. Yes. As well as the physical conduct. You know. Now, taking us back to the distinction between assault and battery. I just use this scenario. If you have a bottle of water, or a glass of water, mm -hmm. and you throw the glass of water at somebody, the act of throwing the water at the person is assault. Yes. Once a drop of the water touches the person, it becomes that becomes battery. Yeah. You know, so they're just, that is the little line between assault and battery. And that is why battery. mostly they are lumped together as assault, assault and battery, battery because yeah. they can never be battery without assault, mm. although they can be assault yes. without yes, battery. definitely. Yes. So it's the apprehension of, of, of battery, yes. which is assault. Yes. But then what about this, where mm. people like to play? I mean, you're standing somewhere and I run behind you and then mm. cover your eyes. Yes. I mean, if the person, the victim <laughs> decides that he wants to see you, the person can actually well, succeed. Um, like you were saying, uh, we are talking about consent here yes. because uh, what you are talking about is everyday uh, happenings and you realize that in everyday life there are so many ways we interact with each other and if we are going to sue, uh, I believe <laughs> we cannot live as humans in society. No. So <laughs> it will open a huge floodgate which we cannot even control. So uh, the law provides for an implied consent. For the example you gave about the kids or yeah. adults playing Adult play, and yeah. one holding <laughs> their eyes, well, it depends on the circumstances. If you know it is a friend who is behind you or who is... I mean, if it is a play scenario mm -hmm. and this takes place, I doubt if you can mount a successful action of battery on such a scenario or mm -hmm. fact pattern. And then moving on further, I think I talked about privileged consent, which is yes. where the law provides for uh, the police to be able to use certain amounts of force mm -hmm. when they are arresting uh, uh, criminals yes. or alleged criminals. Actually, with way. arrest, you, act, you, you would need necessarily to touch the body to unless the person submits. The body, that yes. is so. So all these will come under consent and in distinguishing the lack of consent, which is also an element in proving assault and battery, these distinctions must be made so that if you go to court, uh, you, you realize that you need to present a good case before you can actually get uh, whatever relief you are seeking from the court. Then again, we go further to the very final um, element, which is a positive act. So it is, uh, uh, there's a maxim in law which is that not doing is not trespass. Yeah. You must do. 
<laughs> as in, you must actually... There must be a contact. There must be a contact. Acts. There must be something you did. For an assault, you sort of said something or acted in a way yeah. as to put some fear in another. Mm -hmm. For battery, you actually proceeded to tap, hit, slap, or use an element so or implement to hit where the other somebody person. says to you i'll beat you i'll beat you yes. and you see that this guy cannot beat you mm -hmm. it cannot be assault well, notwithstanding the fact that <laughs> you know you, i mean no matter your claim that mm. yeah i was scared i was put in this position where i i, I, I anticipated that he was going to beat me in yes. reality i mean it cannot be when you look at the person and but well, when we say that uh, <laughs> mere words per se would not amount to cannot amount to assault. Yes. So our mere threatening words. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the context always determines whether or not Mr. B, the defendant, had a reasonable apprehension of, yeah. of, of, of uh, the contact yes. being executed. And this has to be proved by um, showing that the person making the threat has the capacity and the ability to execute whatever he said. Yes. To put you in this place where you're so scared that it was, it's going to happen almost immediately. So, so let's look at the scenario of assault. Somebody points a gun mm -hmm. at you. Mm -hmm. If you are within reasonable shooting range, mm -hmm. naturally you have a, an apprehension because you are in a position to tell whether or not the gun is loaded. Yes. If you are 400 or 1,000 kilometers, 1,000 meters away, Mm -hmm. and somebody points a gun at you, you're not within reasonable shooting range. Then he may you have to call you that, to tell you that I'm pointing a gun at you. you know, even, even if you see it, you cannot say that the person was in a position to have caused you that contact. Yeah. You know, so it's about the scenarios. Mm. The ability or the situation of the person or the aggressor to actually execute the threatened act is what will determine whether you are reasonably expected to have apprehended the fear. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, timorousness or timidity mm -hmm. is not uh, a, a defense, as it were. It doesn't matter that the plaintiff is a timorous soul or is a very timid person and he cannot sort of uh, stand to whatever threat that is imminent. No. Yeah. It is regardless of that, he can successfully mount an action mm -hmm. if all the other elements are proven. So once the plaintiff is uh, maybe a, a mere person like myself <laughs> and he's faced with a macho man who is <laughs> <laughs> twice or three times his size, you know, it doesn't matter. Once he has that imminent fear mm -hmm. that something is going to happen to him or once this macho man goes ahead to slap him or hit him, he can successfully mount an action in towards. There's this thing that people do action. where you stand by the road and somebody actually drives in a way that he makes, he's not, his intention perhaps mm -hmm. is not to hit you, mm -hmm. but then to make you feel like he's about to hit you. I think that should qualify as assault. That, that's, that will qualify because as assault. You, you were scared that your life was in danger at that moment in yes. time. And just to look at the other coin of what my colleague submitted on, it's also the that well-built macho man, mm -hmm. even faced with uh, somebody who is his opposite by your structure, yes. can also have an apprehension of contact. It's not so much about fear, apprehension of contact yes. or harm. And contact that you do not consent to. Like we, like you, of course, you're not, all these discussions in the context that nobody has consented, consented. to it. Yeah. So the similar, same vein that somebody who is a coward mm -hmm. would can, can sustain an action for assault. Mm -hmm. It's in the same vein that somebody who is brave can also sustain the same action for, and for, I, for I assault. Because not, it's not about fear, per yes, se. Yes. But then anticipating that somebody is coming to make contact with you, which is unwelcome. It's unwelcome. I, at this juncture, I would like to chip this in, not because I'm a woman, but the men who are in the habit of patting women's backsides as they walk along. Mm. I mean, you're opening yourself <laughs> up to... Aside, you know, you know the of definition face. of battery does not also... also includes harassment. So by that act, it's not just a thing of sexual, you know, harassment. Mm -hmm. But you could open yourself up to a suit for um, assault and battery. That is so. In fact, for battery, the, the conduct even need not be hostile. Yes. Or aggressive. Yes. So an unwelcome case 
in yes. the battery. Totally. <laughs> you know, once you don't consent to it, it's a welcome. <laughs> it will be battery. Whether I applied force or just a little peg, mm -hmm. it will still be battery. Yes. Once it's a welcome. And it does not have to even be um, um, the person's body touching your body. Mm -hmm. It could be using something, something. to touch your yes. body. Yes. An instrument. An instrument, oh. a chair. Yeah. Maybe you want to sit down. A drink. And then, and then I pull the chair from under you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then you fall. You yeah. sit on the ground. That is battery. I, I try to use um, substitute, anticipate fear and all of that for, mm. you know, for scared and all for our viewers' benefit. Mm. Because um, the essence of Law Express is to make the show as less technical as possible so that our viewers can come along with us. Still to come on Law Express. Dragged me out of the car, started beating me, slapping me, punching me, asking me whether the road is for my dad or is for me. I will and advise so, people to actually take it up and sue people for assault and battery to develop the law on that particular uh, area of the law. Before we proceed, let me, with apologies, take us back to the criminal uh, court. That's okay. Um, let's look at section. I found it pretty interesting. I just thought I should bring it up. Section 88A. Mm -hmm. It's on cruel customs or practices in relation to bereaved spouses, etc. Okay. And if I may just read it out. One, whoever compels a bereaved spouse or a relative of said spouse to undergo any custom or practice that is cruel in nature shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. Two, for the purposes of subsection one of this section, a custom or practice shall be deemed to be cruel in nature if it constitutes an assault within the meaning of, you know, sections 85, 86, 87, and 88. Yes. You know, so, you know, typically, uh, a husband dies and the wife is subjected to all manner of what they call customary practices, mm -hmm. shaving of the woman's head and all yeah. of that. Yeah. You are forced to sit at a place for a long time. Mm -hmm. You are forced to eat something. All of those are deemed as assaults. Yes. And they are also, they fall under section 80, it's also a misdemeanor. Yes. And you aside know. that, even more seriously, there are human rights abuses. Yes, of so course. So if you, you engage in such activities, you're opening yourself up to all manner all of manner actions. All manner of actions. Know, <laughs> a potpourri of actions. Yes, <laughs> so, so the, human, the, the human dimension, as well as it also would amount to assault and battery. Yes. You know. um, moving on to the um, um, defenses for assault and battery. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, you mentioned uh, authority, yeah. where the police has that power or is given that, you know, authority to be able to touch people, actually commit battery in the course of arrest and yeah. all of that. On the police, um, mm -hmm. that is in execution of lawful arrest. Yes, yes, absolutely. So the police officer should, and the laws to police arrest should be done. Yes. But in circumstances where the person tries to abscond, uh, the yes. person is violent, resisting arrest and all of that, some reasonable restraint. Reasonable restraint. But the police only permitted to apply force in arrest if the person being arrested resists arrest. Yes. Or is absconding. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as you indicated, it should be reasonable. Yes. And the reasonableness of it is always determined by how much force you applied. And whether it you know, corresponds, corresponds with, to the you know, level of resistance, the, resistance. <laughs> the person was put up. Yes. Do you put a bullet in his leg? It means that stretching it a bit, though I know it's not that far-fetched, if you come to arrest somebody and the person submits by conduct and action, and you still go ahead to put, in, put the person cuffs and you know, on that. cuffs, I don't know if that could, you know. Well, the person can sue for battery then. If yes. the force that is applied is unreasonable, yeah, that is the basic limit. Because uh, if the person actually does not uh, resist, he 
he, 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 actually, he actually submits, submits himself. Let's go. Let's yes. go. And you still want to turn the person around, hook him up, and put him in cuffs. Then the police body is on the frolic of his own. Mm. And to the extent... <laughs> the law will that, catch up. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. That person can sue. He can also then report the policeman yes. for uh, uh, assault and battery. Mm -hmm. Yes, under the criminal jurisprudence. Yes. So then again, another defense will be self-defense, which we haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. Um, if, for instance, uh, someone wants to uh, hit me and in the process I hit him, <laughs> you see, I can mount up a successful defense of self-defense yeah. within the situation because under the circumstances, I was trying to defend myself mm -hmm. whilst that fear was imminent or whilst that battery was uh, about to be perpetrated on my person. So self-defense can also count as a defense uh, in, in court when you are successfully sued for an assault and battery. And, and on self-defense, you're looking at reasonable self-defense. <laughs> reasonable self-defense. Reasonable so. uh, use of force on your part. Yes, yes. So what's, yes. If, if somebody was just trying, was to, just trying to give you, you a knock, <laughs> Or gives you a knock, yes. and you go for the juggler downstairs. <laughs> Probably yours might be well, more excessive. So, yes. You know, so reasonable self-defense, yes, yes. and and the the that self-defense would cover, in fact, by my reading, defense of harm to your child, yes, spouse, yes. or somebody under self, your care. under your control. Yes. Yes. that would also be come under the umbrella of. Yeah. Self-defense. Self yeah, it's reasonable self-defense, yeah. of course. No. I, 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 another defense would be um, parental consent mm. or authority, yes. where your, your mother, cons uh, a mother consents that you, you discipline her, her daughter or her child. Do people like to argue this particular um, defense in line with uh, human rights, abuse, and all of that? Mm -hmm. I think it's about how proportionate that uh, punishment is to whatever um, uh, misbehavior that the child may have committed. Yes, that is so. And uh, even recently in the UK, mm -hmm. uh, in a quite recent case in 1998. The 1998? Yes. Quite well, recent. recent. <laughs> in the law, that is in recent. In the law, it is very recent. So, <laughs> yes, um, the UK House of Lords ruled that uh, Punishment. In actual fact, it held that punishment, which is the use of uh, force in punishing a child, may amount to battery if the level of force is disproportionate to the child's behavior or if the child does not understand the purpose of the punishment. So there are two legs. The level of force must be proportionate mm -hmm. to the child's behavior. And the child must understand the reason for or the purpose for the punishment. Yeah. You don't just get up and start slapping your child or hitting him with a cane or any other instrument just because you feel like it. But then the child must have committed a particular offense within the domestic setting. And you actually tell the child that this is why I'm punishing you. Mm -hmm. And the force you apply must be proportionate. So as it were as... Uh, uh, my colleague was also saying the force must be reasonable within the circumstances. You cannot use uh, a hammer or a sledgehammer to kill an ant. Yeah. No, not when you are also trying to correct uh, your you child. You can, but then it will be too... You know. <laughs> well, actually <laughs> you can, yeah. but it will be disproportionate <laughs> yeah. within the circumstances. <laughs> so yes, when you are trying to correct your child, you should be able to use a reasonable amount of force for the child to know that this is why That is if you believe it. in using force to chastise a that child. That is so too, you know? yes. Because well, there are so many other ways of correcting children. Yes. And so, uh, well, this discussion will find a rubric of lawful correction. Yes. yes. Now, so, as if you need uh, lashing of children at school by a teacher. Yes. Would fall under lawful correction. Mm -hmm. At home, of course, Correcting your child by applying a cane or for a lawful correction. Mm -hmm. uh, apprentices. There's some room for lawful correction of apprentices. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this is circumscribed by law. That's mm -hmm. how much of the force to apply. In addition to the British case he, he, my colleague, indicated, in fact, our children's act itself yes. stipulates, and as he said, how correction should be effected. You don't 
you can't correct a child by use of force if the child does not even understand the import of what he has done and the consequence of the correction. You know, so there are various ingredients. The child must know the import of what he has done, that he has done something wrong. But in all the examples you've just given, um, I'm talking of the categories, I think it's also, you know, boils down to whether it's proportionate. Reasonableness. Because if, you know, a child at school misbehaves and you beat him and, until the child Stop. collapses, we can say that as, you know, lawful correction. No, not at all. And there was you a know. recent case where a teacher was stepping on one of the children mm -hmm. and uh, that is... <laughs> way beyond even with form. parents yes. i mean there's a limit to you know how much force you can use to correct a child yes, yes, so yes. it's it's all about how reasonable how you about your it. action is yes. i mean to achieve the intended purpose yeah. we'll go on a quick commercial break we'll be right back Our viewers at this point will be wondering, yes, so I've been able to um, come to this place where I know I've been assaulted or battered. What do I do? Where do I go to? The first point of call might be to the police station, yeah. you know, in, within reasonable time to report what has happened. I know there are other um, opportunities for which you can be remedied or compensated. So for the police, yes, uh, you mentioned reasonable time. Reasonable time because probably suffer some injuries and it should, the police should be able to capture the injuries right away, should be able to seek medical attention right away. Yeah. Other than that, there's no limitation yes. for, for, for the criminal parts. Mm -hmm. So you report to the police right away and the police should, after taking your statements, effect the relevant arrest of the person. And once they do that, then the ball is in the court of the state to, to please the person before court. Mm -hmm. and prosecute the person. Well, for when the person is placed before court, the person is entitled to defend himself. Yes. If we consider the various defenses. So the accused person is entitled to invoke any of these defenses. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know. Then again, you can also mount up a civil action <clears throat> because that can run concurrently with the criminal action. Yes. It does not matter whether the person is convicted in the criminal court or not. Once you are able to establish that all these things happened, all the elements that we have described are present, yeah. you can successfully mount a civil action in court. And the outcome is likely to be damages, damages which is monetary yes. compensation. Monetary compensation. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And yes, if you are successful in court, you may be smiling to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and then your injuries might, you know, give you more damages. Yes. Although yes. Yes. with um, assault and battery, you, you do need not to need to necessarily yeah. prove that you've been injured. That is so. That yeah, is on so. the damage, of course. So there are two legs, general damages. Mm -hmm. Where, of course, you don't need to prove that you suffered any injury or harm. So we say it's a large. Yes. There's, it's for the judge, based on his discretion, mm -hmm. based on the circumstances of your case, to award you what he thinks you're entitled to. And there can also be special damages, which will be based on actual expenses incurred as a mm -hmm. result of the damage. Yes. For example, you were beaten up. Yeah. For which reason you had to go to the hospital, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't have an NHIS card, so you had to pay up. And also, your, your we bills. looking at psychological, you Psychological, know, yes, you uh, had to see a injury. psychiatrist, something, mm -hmm. yeah. to talk to you. You incurred costs, so actual costs incurred as yeah. a result of But like I always the say, the name of the game is evidence. It's evidence. You definitely have to prove it to the letter before the court will go with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the advice there mind. is that for if you are minded to pursue the civil action, and you also uh, incurred any costs, mm -hmm. You are advised keep to keep, keep records of all the calls you incurred mm. Every step leading of the way. to court. Yeah. Because it will boil down to do you have receipt, do you have any evidence to that effect? Yeah. And that's the beauty about the law. If you take the criminal approach by lodging a report to the police, first, the end result is not for your personal benefit, so to say. Because the end result is either to find the person or imprison him. Yeah. Mm. That is for the state. But so that the criminal approach wouldn't necessarily bring you any, any, any dividends any to you. Any compensation. Compensation to you. 
and that's the beauty of the civil one. The civil one will give you, put some money in your pocket. And you are in control, you decide. Yeah. I'm a taxi driver and have been driving for the past six years. One day I was driving in my lane. When a car crossed me without indicating. So when we got to the traffic light, it was red. So I asked them why they were driving that way. But before I could say Jack, they came out of their car, dragged me out of the car, started beating me, slapping me, punching me, asking me whether the road is for my dad or is for me. They did unnecessary things to me. Sat in their car and then sped off. So I took their number, contacted a friend who said I could get a lawyer to take them on. Let's turn our minds to the situation that confronts us now. Mm -hmm. The gentleman yeah. was um, attacked on the road after he was crossed. Yes. And uh, they, they started by threatening to beat him, insulting him, heckling at him. Mm -hmm. They put him in that place where he anticipated that they were about to make some form of contact, which clearly he didn't consent to. Mm -hmm. So I see a clear situation of assault yes. here. Yes. I also see a very clear situation of assault and definitely a battery as well, since they went a step further to actually beat him. Yeah. So his first point of call should be to the police. Mm -hmm. Uh, he should report the incident to the police. That is after he has sought medical attention. Yes. Yes. And then, like my colleague was saying earlier, he must uh, make sure that he takes uh, a medical report yeah. to the police. Sometimes, some people even suggest that you go, if you're not too badly injured, such mm. that you can't move, you go to the police station first. Yes. You pick a form and then you go to to the yes. hospital. Well, it depends yes. because uh, we are not all versed in medical matters. It yeah. would be best if you go first to the hospital okay. and seek medical attention. Otherwise, you may not even make it to the police station <laughs> in the first place. So, yes, go to the hospital, seek medical attention, then get a report on the medical condition or whatever has happened, mm -hmm. and then you can proceed to the police uh, to make a report uh, about the assault and battery the police will investigate. You should be able to help the police in their investigations, assist them. Uh, the, the work of the police is such that they need assistance. Yeah. So once you report, you don't just go to sleep. You help them investigate and you help them with whatever assistance evidence, they need. Evidence, all, gathering yeah. and all that. Then again, after you are able to report the situation, the police will handle yeah. the criminal aspect of it. Yeah. Then you can I think see, there's a civil Yes, um, there is a civil yes. aspect. Um, and then, I think my yeah, but even before one, that, yeah. I mean, hopefully, if you come out of the beating with <laughs> your <one> eyes, <laughs> you know, quite clear, should, you should try and identify the people. Yes. The prospective uh, from the narration, defendant. he said it was one person. Okay, and I just hope that he's able to find the person. It being a road situation where yeah. it's not like something that happens in, happened in his neighborhood. So, so the person who beat him up, who will be the subject matter of any action for the battery, should be identified. The other people who place themselves in the position of assault should also be yeah. identified. Yeah, you know. So, and that's and and once with that identified, we was that a report are going to lodge will be against specific people. Yes. So you should. So my colleague has asked for the criminal uh, processes. So once the police are doing their own thing, as I said, the end result of the police work will not put money in your pocket necessarily. <laughs> no. So and if, will not if, if, refund if, if your medical, your medical expenses. You. So you should then engage a lawyer and place your story before him in with as, as you know in, in, in as detailed a manner as possible. The information the lawyer would require would be this: what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you also want to want to know who the people are. You also How want to know where they live. Yes. Home address. Their, their residential or locational addresses or yeah. place of work. Yes. Because you cannot commence an action against somebody if you cannot trace the person. There's no point commencing an action against somebody that you cannot trace. Now, when you've given all these things out to him, it's also important to consider before you go to court. What is the situation in life of the person you are, you are, you are, you are suing? 
In other words, if the person is a man of straw, the person is a man of straw. <laughs> you have to consider: is it worth pursuing that course of action? Because you may end up, you know, um, um, spending more yeah, on, you, you know, the whole action itself, the whole action, than what and you getting end a up judgment with. that will end up being parik. You know, you can't can even enforce it with it. Yeah. Yeah. So all these were considerations. Or of course, you know, the person is a man of straw, but you just want to. Assuage your 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 spirit. Yeah. <laughs> that you suggest into the through the court processes and God judgment for yeah. whatever it is worth. So you should determine what you really want. What's the end? What is the end target? result that you yes. want? Are you minded to invest into that venture? Mm -hmm. You know, for whatever purpose. Yeah. So those are the considerations that you make. You just don't mm -hmm. go to court because mm -hmm. you suffered the wrong. Mm -hmm. And we'll Absolutely. advise people to actually take it up and sue people for assault and battery to yeah. develop the law on that particular uh, area of the law yes. in Ghana. Because in Ghana, it is yeah. largely undeveloped yeah. in People Ghana. People just let these things go. Let these things go. Most let of them stop at the slide. police. Yes, um, they the stop police at the police prosecution, the criminal aspect. That is so, but the yeah. civil aspect should be pursued a little more, yes. Mm. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming on Law Express. Like I already indicated much earlier, the law protects the inviolability of your person. In our day-to-day -day activities, people, however, will definitely end up touching or interfering with other people. My advice is that you should be mindful of what you do when you touch people or engage in contact with people without their consent. When you are a victim of a situation of assault and battery, which has been our topic for today, aside reporting to the police, always make sure to find a lawyer. That way, you can explore all the options available to you. Then you can decide whether or not this is something you want to pursue. You've been listening to Lawyer Bright Autry Ejikum and Lawyer Eddie Makati. My name is Noella Seydu. This has been Law Express.